Psalm 21, 13. Be thou exalted, Lord, in thy own strength. So do we sing and praise thy power. Psalm 21, 13. Great verse. Amen. Amen. All right. First, or, sorry, first Kings. First Kings. You used to sing First Corinthians because it's Sunday morning. You say that every Sunday. First Kings, chapter 21. Uh, we're going to read the chapter. And uh, some of this... Nick song with us. Some of this is an outgrowth of a conversation we had last Sunday morning. And uh, we were talking some about the lesson last week on anger when we studied Moses there in Leviticus chapter 10 and uh, some of the anger he dealt with. And it just seemed like there was maybe more that could have been said um, about that topic. I think that that's something that we, we all deal with and struggle with. So um, Nick and I talked about, and there's several other ways the Lord directed me back to that topic. So we're going to talk about anger again today from a di little different perspective, different text. Uh, but I want to read this chapter, and then we're going to look at Ahab, and I'm sure that you know a little bit about him. Obviously, he's not a good king, and we're going to learn maybe what not to do from his life. But I want to read the chapter, and then we'll focus on verse 4 as our key verse. So there's uh, 29 verses, but, but we'll, uh, we'll read those and then uh, answer four different questions in the study. So, uh, Scott, would you start us at verse 1? <laughs> we'll go around the table, um, and then after I read, why don't we have Andrew, Steve... And then um, Nick, we'll get you in after Steve, okay? Okay, thank you. All right, and then we'll get back to you, Scott. Let's read at least twice. First Kings 21. And it came to pass after these things that Nadal, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jeria, hard, hard by the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. And Ahab spake unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for it a better vineyard than, than it. Or if that would seem good to thee, I will give thee the worth of it in money. And Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers unto thee. And Ahab came into his house, having displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of my fathers. And he laid him down upon his bed and turned away his face and would not eat bread. When Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said unto him, Why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? And he said unto her, Because I spake unto Naboth the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money. Or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. And Jezebel's wife said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise, and eat bread, and let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters, and they have named and sealed them with the seal, and sent the letters unto the elders and the nobles that were in the city, dwelling in Naboth. In those letters she wrote, Proclaim a day of fasting, and seat Naboth in a prominent place among the people. But see and, two scoundrels opposite him. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, was that it, Steve? I... Yeah, that no, was Okay, uh, so this is verse 10. And seat two worthless men before him, and let them testify against him, saying, You cursed God and the king. Then take him out and stone him to death. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who were at the who were the inhabitants of his city, in his city, did as Jezebel had said unto them. 
and as it was written in the letters which was which she had sent unto them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. And there came in two men, children of Belial, and sat before him. And the men of Belial witnessed against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth did blaspheme God and the king. Then they carried him forth out of the city, and stoned him with stones that he died. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth is stoned and is dead. And it came to pass, when Jezebel heard that, that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth and Je the Jezreelite, which he refused to give thee for money, for Na Naboth is not alive, but dead. And it came to pass when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, dead that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he is uh, whether he has gone down to possess him. Say to him, This is what the Lord says. Have you not murdered a man and seized his property? Then say to him, This is what the Lord says. In the place where dogs lift up Naboth's blood, Dogs would look up your blood. Yes, yours. Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and I will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from Ahab him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shut up against the and shut up and left in Israel. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, like the house of Basha, son of Ahijah, for the provocation where, wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Je Jezreel. Him that dieth of Ahab. Of Ahab in the city, the dog shall eat, and him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did bury abominably in following idols, according to all things, as did the Amorites, whom the Lord passed out before he took them to Israel. It came to pass when they had heard those words that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh, and fasted, and lay in sackcloth, and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah and the Tishbite, saying, Have you noticed how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself, I will not bring this disaster in this day, in his day, but I will bring it in his house in the days of his son. Thank you, guys. Okay, let's go back to verse 4. And let's uh, look a little closer at this verse here. Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. It's not there. So let's let's mark the words heavy and displeased. Now let me point out this is not the only time that this specific phrase is used in reference to King Ahab. If you go back to the end of chapter 20, mm -hmm. the very last verse says, and the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased and came to Samaria. And I won't get into the context of what's taking place at the end of chapter 20, but uh, this specific uh, description is used twice of King Ahab. He's heavy and displeased. Now, let's begin by defining those words. So question one, what do these words heavy and displeased mean? So if you want to mark this down, I, I'm going to give you some synonyms, a little bit of uh, definition here. The, the sort of the word heavy. So what do you think heavy means? And I'll give you kind of the, uh, the actual uh, word behind the word there, but heavy. So it doesn't mean obese, if that's what you're thinking. Um, that's not what the word means. To be heavy. So burdened. Okay, burdened down. Yep. 
troubled. Anybody mm-hmm. else? Depressed. Depressed. Okay. So good, good synonyms. Um, the, the word means irritable, peevish. Um, some synonym, synonyms that I found are implacable, resentful, or sullen. So you, you got to, when you, you think of the word implacable, you think of somebody that they are, they're in a bad spot and they don't want to be helped. So it's, it, the people are trying to pull them out of this, but they refuse to be helped. That's, that's the heaviness um, he's having in this moment. Now let's talk about the word displeased. And this is where we get to uh, the conversation that Nick and I had uh, the other day. Um, displeased is really just angry. That's what the word means. To be angry, um, to be vexed, comes from a root word that means to boil up. Um, so that's that, that anger that comes out that we saw with Moses. So he's, he's burdened down, he's irritable, he's angry, out of humor. Um, that, that's, that's his uh, disposition right now. So if we kind of sum that up, Ahab's in a very foul mood. That, that would be maybe the best way to describe the king right now. And he has a, a record and a pattern of, of falling into these moods often. We can see that from chapter 20. We see that here in chapter 21. So uh, women are not the only ones that are moody. You know, we're quick to criticize <laughs> the females for that, but men can be very moody as well. And, and we go through sometimes these mood swings and up and down. And that's, that's King Ahab at this point. So when it says that he's heavy and displeased, it just means he's in a very bad mood. I think about Saul. You know, King Saul was the first king. He had his moods, didn't he? I mean, he, he'd be doing fine, and something would trigger him, and he'd be throwing javelins at people and, you know, just acting like a crazy man. So uh, this is something that I think that a lot of people are susceptible to. And, and leaders, because, like we said last week, the, the pressures that we deal with as leaders sometimes cause us to just blow up um, and, and not keep ourselves under control. So I think it's important to start with definitions there. Now, number two question is also very important. we got to look at the cause. Why was Ahab heavy and displeased? Where did this foul mood come from? What was the trigger? Did anybody find the answer to number two? In verse four? Yes, or, or wherever in the passage. He came home. <laughs> okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe we should look a little bit I don't know what was at all, but you know. Well, he didn't get what he wanted. Okay, yeah, he did not get what he wanted. Now, what did he want? The vineyard. The vineyard, right? He wanted Naboth's vineyard. And the point that is in that, and we don't get from God what we want. Yeah, we want more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. We don't, you know, we always don't get what we want. So somehow that causes us to yeah. just be God. And you think about Ahab has pretty much everything that he could want, you would think, as the king. And yet, it's that, that one vineyard that doesn't belong to him. He's like, I got to have that. And that's human nature, isn't it? I mean, the garden is, you can have everything in the garden, but but the one tree you can't have, and that's what they wanted, human nature to always want what we don't have. And so he set his eyes on this vineyard. And the whole story is very unfair, what happens to Naboth. He gave his life for the vineyard. And I'm I'm sure there's a message and lesson in that, that um, the devil would try to buy us out and tempt us with with a lot of uh, different deals he'd like to make with us and presents his offers. That yeah, takes a lot of other people involved. I've seen that. There's a lot of big companies. There's just one person that's mm-hmm. doing the dishonesty. It's, yeah. it's a culture. We're all yeah. in the same culture. Yeah. It's, you're the king so much that they'll buy into anything he wants to do. Yeah, yeah you're right. There are a lot of different individuals involved <laughs> in this. Nobody will call the truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's really uh, sad. It's sad what happens here. Uh, but I, I do, you know, respect Naboth 
that the king, he was willing to go against the command of the king. He said, give me. It wasn't like, you know, would you? It was a command. He said, look, I can't do this. Why did Naboth not surrender the vineyard to the king? His inheritance. Okay, it was given to him by his father, so it was very precious. He felt a responsibility to hold on to that and not surrender that to this evil king. And what else? What else prompted him to say no? And this is, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself with the lesson tomorrow morning. What's the Bible say about government? But there is a place for civil disobedience in the, the life of the Christian. Not always. We're commanded to submit to the kings and governors. And you're not permitted. Right. Rather, you know, better be out right yep. there. Exactly. He had to make a choice. Sometimes we have to make a choice between the king and God. That doesn't always happen, but if we have to choose, we must obey God rather than man. And that was the case here. Basically, he said, look, I, I can't do this because a greater power and authority than you, King Ahab, has told me no. And he was willing to give his life for that. It's pretty amazing, pretty inspiring. You know, would, would you give your life for God's will and, and doing what the Lord has told you to do? But anyways, coming back to what Nick said a minute ago, he just he didn't get what he wanted. Things did not go his way. Have you ever had that happen before? You have your plans. We're going to, you know, we're going to, we see the vineyard. We're going to get the vineyard. It's going to happen. And then Naboth says no. It's like, I didn't plan this. That happens probably almost every day. We have our plans and things don't go as planned. So how do you respond when, when things don't go your way? Oftentimes, we respond the same way as they have. We become very moody and upset and uh, heavy and displeased. And uh, unfortunately, um, this is a trend in, in many of our lives. So let's move on um, to question three. And this is an important one as well. So who is going to suffer the most from Ahab's bad mood. Who's going to suffer the most from Ahab's bad mood? He's going to suffer, right? He's making himself miserable. Do you know that in verse 4, uh, that he, he comes home and um, he lays on his bed, um, having a, a pity party for himself, and then he turns away his face. He's not eating anything. He's just, he's so upset that he's refusing even uh, food, and he's just, you know, just kind of wallowing in self-pity and misery. Um, so he's making himself miserable. But I think that there's there's uh, others that are maybe more miserable than even Ahab because of... Well, definitely you know, Naboth, right? I mean, he was stoned. One could yeah. argue that because he was stoned, it was yeah. maybe a temporary suffering if he was... Uh, not necessarily saved, but if he was doing the will of the Lord, we can assume that because when he died, he went to heaven, perhaps, that maybe that t suffering was temporary, but yeah, we can't look past that. Right, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Naboth did greatly suffer because of this this uh, fit of anger and selfishness. Okay, yeah, his descendants. I'm going to focus in on his family here. Um, again, notice the phrase that Jesse pointed out that he he came into his house, so that in verse 4, and came into his house having displeased. Verse 43, previous chapter, the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased. So he, he has this interaction with Naboth outside of his home. It greatly upsets him. And then he brings that anger and foul mood into his home. And so as he comes into the home, he's bringing this, this foul spirit with him into his home and, and to his family. So I think that we could say that his family probably suffered the most from Ahab's bad mood. His wife Jezebel, he has a couple boys. If you keep reading today, I was reading uh, 2 Kings 1 through 5, and you read of Ahaziah and Jehoram. Those are both his boys that would reign after him. And neither one of them were very, very good kings. Uh, they, they learned that from their dad. But, but they had all, they were there in this home and they, they experienced this foul mood that he brings into the home. Now, what is, 
what is a good application for us and what's a lesson we need to learn from Ahab here? You've had a bad day at work or something has gone wrong, you know, in, in uh, some interaction you've had. What do we have to be very careful that we don't do? Satan getting a foothold. Okay, Satan gets a foothold in our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And then it starts it to, to our kids. Yeah, yeah, you it start showing how we act. And they act right. that way as they grow up. Right, exactly. And we bring that into the home and we destroy the spirit in the home with our bad mood. I want to uh, point out a cross reference here. So if you'll flip over to the right uh, and go to the book of Esther for a moment. Pastor, that reminds me of binding the strong man. And, uh, you know, when it comes to anger, if Satan can bind us that way then as leaders and fathers uh we're kind of allowing ourselves to be tied up in a way that you can then loot the house right that's right yes exactly nick yeah thanks for bringing us back to that that key verse devil's after us so he can get at our families um esther chapter five you, know, you learn from positive examples you learn sometimes more from poor examples and uh, I think of, uh, as returning here, I, th I think of, I had the opportunity to be coached by a lot of different, different individuals through time. And some really good coaches, some not so good. Uh, I had a coach, when I, when I transferred from Christian school to public school my last three years, uh, I was in public school. And the coach that I had was extremely competitive. And... I didn't realize when we moved to the school, but they had only won three games um, the year before. And so, um, you know, he, that just that whole scenario, I think, was hard for him because he was used to winning. And he would just lose his mind out there. I mean, I, um, red face, veins popping out. I mean, he broke the locker room door several times and mangled ball racks and, you know, just was, was out of control. And I learned from him what not to do. Um, I, I remember making mental notes. If I ever have an opportunity to coach, I don't want to look like that. So you, you learn uh, from poor examples. And here's another poor example uh, along with Ahab. Look at Haman for a second here. And obviously Haman was, was not a safe man either. Um, but Esther chapter 5. And uh, look at verse... Let me back it up to uh, verse 8. And it would be nice to get all the context here, but uh, Esther has invited, she's going to invite the king and Haman to this banquet, and, and she um, is about to disclose that she's a Jew, or people are, are being targeted and uh, soon attacked. But uh, look, at, look at verse 8. Uh, she says to King Hadjuarius, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, if it please the king to grant my petition and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them. And I will do tomorrow as the king had said. Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. And when Haman saw Mordecai, and remember this is Esther's cousin, uh, he saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him. He was full of indignation against Mordecai. I think it's interesting in one verse, he goes from joyful and glad to full of indignation. I mean, just, just that quick it snapped and, and went from one extreme to the other. Uh, verse 10, nevertheless, Haman refrained himself when he came home. Same phrase, he came home. He sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife, and Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things when the king had promoted him, how he had advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. Haman said, moreover, yea, Esther the queen would let no man come in with the king under the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow I'm invited under her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then said Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends in him, let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou to the king, that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou and merrily with the king under the banquet, and think, please, amen, and cause the gallows to be made. 
So here's another example. A man that comes home is in a bad mood and he impacts and infects um, the whole the whole home there. Now let's go back to our, our text in First Kings and let's talk about Jezebel just for a moment. Because here he is, he's on his bed and he's pouting and uh, he's upset. Look at verse 5, 21, 5. It says, but Jezebel's wife came to him and said to him, why is thy spirit so sad that thou eatest no bread? So she, it's bothering her. So, you know, when you're one, and, and this was a, you know, this wasn't exactly a picture perfect marriage. I mean, there are lots of problems, but but when when you're in a foul mood, your spouse is impacted, I mean, and, and vice versa. You're one, so you, you sense that. She senses something's wrong with my husband. So she asked him about it. Uh, verse six, and he said unto her, "Now let me just put a word of caution here that." He's about to spill his guts to uh, to Jezebel, and that's going to set her off. And she she comes up with this plan to kill Naboth and to steal the vineyard. But it's really Ahab's fault because he's in this mood, and then he just says everything to Jezebel. And I know the Bible says she stirs him up, but Ahab also stirred her up. And he tells her in verse 6, because I spake in the Naboth, the Jezreelite, and said unto him, Give me thy vineyard for money, or else, if it please thee, I will give thee another vineyard for it. And he answered, I will not give thee my vineyard. I think there's a wisdom that we have to develop. It's not that we're being dishonest, uh, those that are in, in marriage. It's not that we're being dishonest with our spouse. But there's sometimes that we have to withhold information or we have to be careful when we share that, knowing that our spouse can't always handle all of that. Turn back to chapter 19 just for a second. First Kings 19. This is right after Mount Carmel experience. And uh, fire from heaven falls, consumes the sacrifice. The people say the Lord, he is God. Then they attack the uh, prophets of Baal. And they, they kill the prophets of Baal. And Ahab comes home again, look at 19.1. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. And with all how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message unto Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So he was in a habit of just unloading on Jezebel. And it would just set her off. And I try to walk this line, again, in, in, no, in no way do I want to keep things from my wife that she needs to know, but I, I need discernment on when do I share that? How do I share that? Do I share that? You know, there's some things that we just carry as men. And these are not things that would impact our family or not withholding information that they would discover later on, but just there's things that I know or things I experience. I'm like, you know what? That's going to that's gonna set my spouse on a path that they don't need to be on. And so we have to have discernment. And Ahab here just quickly shares all this with Jezebel. And then uh, back, in, back in 21, that's when she comes up with this scheme and plan to remove Naboth and steal the vineyard. So I guess what I'm just getting back to is when we are in that mood, it's very unfair to our family that we bring that into the home and we destroy whatever the spirit was in the home that's not right of us. So, you know, it's why it's kind of nice. I know some of you guys are working from home. It's kind of nice when you have a little separation, you know, because you can allow the Lord to kind of cleanse your mind and get yourself right before you walk in the door. If you're working from home, you know, it's going to be a little more challenging. But it, it, again, the lesson applies there that we have a responsibility to control the uh, spiritual thermostat in our homes. That's on us as men. And Ahab did not do a good job of that. So consider who your anger will impact. You know, I think about, before I go to uh, number four, I think about my dad. Uh, and uh, I spent a little time with him this past Thursday. It's kind of uh, interesting. They have a, a pastor that's moving from Pennsylvania to Ohio, um, been hired, assistant pastor, been hired at the church. 
but he's trying to sell his home here and he's got to get some stuff finished up. So one of the ministers my dad has just helping and encouraging and um, he's very good at construction things. So he took a couple of days to help this man came over. He called me and said, hey, would you, would you come down and give us a hand? I said, I, I can only come down Thursday for a few hours. And so we ended up in the upstairs bathroom putting a bathtub in together. So that was, you know, was interesting, but we got it in. And, uh, but I was thinking about my dad, before he was in construction, he worked at a factory in Worcester, Ohio. And if you ever worked in a factory, I and mean, Mike, you go in factories all the time. I mean, it's, it's not the, the greatest environment for a Christian man. He was a welder and machinist, and it was just, it was kind of a rough, rough time for him, but he was providing for his family. And I know that it was a, it was a good 30 minute drive, 40 minute drive from Worcester to Butler, Ohio, where he lived. And I know that my dad would try to, he, he got, he got some flack because he was a Christian and, um, but he would try to get himself right. I, I never remember my dad coming in the front door angry. I remember being tired different times, like, guys, you got to help me up the stairs, you know, I'm worn out. But but he was never angry. And I'm sure he could have been, but somehow he was able to let the Lord take those burdens. And it helped us have a, maintain a good environment in our home. So we have to work at it. Now, let's go to number four, and we'll finish this out. I won't be able to go through every, every verse here, but how did Ahab get over his heaviness and displeasure? There might be a couple answers to this, this one here. How do you get over this? I think it's important with Moses last week after he talked to Aaron, then he was he was contented. So when when we're having these feelings and we're moving into that bad mood and things aren't going our way and we want to just have a pity party, you know, what how how do we get past that? Sometimes it's easier said than done. You might think, well, kill Naboth and steal him, but now I'm happy. I got what I wanted. That, you know, I don't know that that's maybe he got a, temp, a temporary joy and, oh, I got what I wanted, but that's uh, that's not going to last. Anybody see Mike? Well, <clears throat> he talked it out. Okay. That, that helps a lot to talk about it. Get it out in the open. Yeah. yeah. But again, you have to be very discernible, mm -hmm. discerning who you, who you tell and how much information you release. But I think just talking things out really does help you to go over your heaviness. Yeah, there is something to that, isn't there? And I think that he was unwise um, knowing his wife and the, the short fuse that she had and what could happen from this. Maybe, maybe he was hoping that she would, she would take action and remove the obstacle. I don't know. But there is something to um, expressing your thoughts to a trusted counselor advisor, whoever that may be, um, but also being discerned at the same time. Anybody else? Andrew? So it's a kind of a, almost a trick question. You know? <laughs> he, um, he's in the wrong in the first place. Mm -hmm. So he's selfless and he's covetous. Mm -hmm. So if we were dis, you know, displeased about something that was not those things that were going to be displeased, and that's maybe a different story. Mm -hmm. But here, what is he going to do? God, please give me the desires of my wicked heart. Like, mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Right. So I think what would have been good was if he just jumped right down to verse 27, yeah. where he showed himself humble mm -hmm. and he said, you know, hey, you know, Lord, I, I'm covetous and I, I'm focusing on myself when I should not be king. I should be focusing on the kingdom. I should be focusing on you and I'm focusing on this thing, all that being neglected. So can you forgive me? And because it, it's negligible and he forgets it and he does what he should be doing. So he's in the wrong place to begin with and he's mm -hmm. here, right? I think that's a different yeah. story as to whether like being a hard day at work is not sin. Yeah. That's a different yeah. path. But here he's already wrong. He's got to do that right. Yeah. Yeah. How does Elijah factor in? How, how do we make the application of Elijah here? You know, God specifically gives him instructions. God knew exactly where Ahab was at this point as he's going down to take possession wrongfully of this vineyard. Um how does Elijah factor into this? Any thoughts? I don't know why the nerve to come back, but <laughs> Elijah? Yeah, I'm yeah. Do that. Yeah. He was doing, I think, what God told him to do. And that would not have been easy to confront Ahab again. Ahab calls him his enemy. And and maybe the takeaway is that we need we need Elijah's in our lives. 
you know, people that we might see as the enemy, this, you know, they're, they're going to confront me. They're going to convict me. But people that will really tell us the truth. You're acting like an adolescent. You know, like Andrew said, the job of the king is not to collect vineyards. It's to care for the people. And then you become selfish. Now you, you've murdered a man. Uh, you've stolen his possession. God's going to judge you. I mean, no one likes to hear that message. But we need Elijahs in our lives that will point out our selfishness, our bad moods. You know, I mean, there, there have been times and never once did I enjoy it. But there have been times when I've been confronted by others, you know, hey, what's wrong with you today? You know, and you kind of, nothing's wrong with me. You kind of got that edge. But, you know, if you need people that will, help you to see, look, you're not acting right. And it's impacting everybody. So before you get as far as exactly. Yeah. And that's yeah. Kind of yeah. And it's too bad that Jezebel couldn't, could not have done that for Ahab, you know, really what he needed was her to gently correct him that look, this isn't right, but she didn't really, he didn't really need her to um, remove Naboth and give him the vineyard. Uh, he needed her to just tell him the truth, but we need Elijah. And so uh, maybe God has called us to be an Elijah. And that's hard. That, like, like Jim was saying, that's tough to confront somebody. Look, you know, what's going on and, and, and why is this happening? What's, what's bringing about these things? But I think that is, is one of the keys to uh, finding the humility at the end of the, the passage there. Ahab's a different person, and you really see the grace and mercy of God on display here. I mean, Ahab, the Bible says he sold himself to do evil. He was a wicked, wicked man, followed idols. And yet, in verse 27, he had a change of heart. He repented, fasted, lay in sackcloth, went softly. And God says to Elijah, hey, did you see how Ahab humbled himself? I mean, it's just amazing that uh, God's forgiveness and compassion on this wicked man, yeah, his mercy on it, just amazing. And so we see a change in Ahab after he encounters Elijah. And so I think that that's, that is important for us to have people in our lives that we trust that will tell us the truth. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of enemy are deceit. So we, we, need, we need to have a relationship amongst ourselves that, we kind of pick up on, hey, somebody's struggling, and and we have a, a trusted person that can confront us like Elijah did. I'm not sure you're right on that last verse. On the last verse with which one? Well, the last one. I mean, what of us would want to be laid on our sides? So I'm not sure God had compassion. He did go on a lot of day, but yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. Tell you, sometimes you get to it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. I hear Yeah. 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 Something. More of us would say if something bad's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It is. It's going to have the father than the son. Right. Right. And this wasn't the first place that God delayed His judgment. You think of uh, Hezekiah and some of His decisions He made that were trained. You know, God delayed judgment there with Manasseh. So, yeah, it's, um, but I think the, the key here is that we need to be humbled. We need to repent of our selfishness. Um, we need a change. And that's something that only God can really do. And uh, being aware of the influence of our, our decisions. Uh, other thoughts or questions or takeaways from, from the passage here on Ahab? Like, I just think it's interesting. I think a lot about my boss. Yeah. And you think about a king, they're not used to being told no. <laughs> and so, I mean, this whole passage to me just speaks of the pride of always being, yeah. all, always thinking you're right. <laughs> and yeah. no matter what happens, that you want to get your way. But you see a tr- a, dr- traumatic, a dramatic turn in yes. this passage where Ahab realizes that he did wrong and yeah. he's repentant. Yeah. And you don't see that. I mean, you sometimes see that in the visual, but a lot of times, not much. Yeah, not much. Yeah. That's what really struck me is there's anger is just an outcome of Christ. In that. Mm, yes. Right, right. You know, the same, it's the same example with Esther. Yeah. Um, you know, Mordecai didn't do exactly what he wanted. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, so it, it's interesting how 
fights, and then probably are more apt to be triggered into anger yes. than humble men who you know don't always want to get their way. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's what you're saying. Anger is a symptom um, of a deeper issue. And for, I mean, only by pride comes contention. The Bible says pride is a, a problem that we all deal with. So anger just reveals that there's a deeper issue going on. Yeah, anybody else? Jezebel thinks she's entitled. Mm -hmm. you know, or I often think so. I often think, well, I'm entitled to that. You know, they haven't given me enough idea, so I'll take this from a lawyer or something. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if I don't get my way, I, I'm entitled to just take it or do what I want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm entitled. It seems like the Lord will work in our lives repeatedly and emphasize certain things. And that seems to be a point of emphasis right now in my life is being open-minded to God's leading. And if it's different than what I expected, being okay with that. As we get older, we get more set in our ways. And I'm, you know, I, I like things a certain way. And, you know, I'm pretty systematic and routine, traditional. But there have been some things recently where it's like the Lord said, well, what if, you know, what if the vineyard is not, what if that's not my will? Are we okay with God saying no? And I think that we struggle with that sometimes, just saying, God, okay, if that's not what you want today, I'll go this direction. And, and being flexible and letting the Lord lead. When he closes a door, are we okay with that? Even if we thought that was the direction we were heading. Anybody else? Hey, Pastor, just a, a couple comments. Um, <clears throat> you were talking about Haman before and Esther, and I noted that anger is in your head, and it's an attitude that needs to be controlled because Haman exercised self-control when he got angry and went home. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that that was interesting that, you know, like a lot of sin, it starts with a thought. It starts in your head. And if you don't stop it there, it can uh, accelerate rapidly <clears throat> into an action. Yeah. And you don't, sometimes you often don't have the luxury of a, a cool down period or a separation from work to home or some space between an incident and your reaction but without that cool down without any prayer you're just reacting to what you're feeling and sometimes it's a situation like um ahab went through where he said i i tried to go do this thing i got denied and he had a chance really to think it through to talk about it with jezebel <laughs> And I'm, I wrote a note, you need more Elijah's and less Jezebel's, <laughs> but you need more, Eli yeah, more Elijah's. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Less Jezebel's, but it's like, sometimes, you know, you, you get angry in the heat of the moment and it's, you don't have that time to think about what you're going to do before you're already reacting to the situation. Um, and those, that phrase you said earlier, what's wrong with you today? Uh, those are fighting words. <laughs> it's yeah. when someone questions you, I was trying to think of a contrast there. If somebody who knows me pretty well said to me, you know, my wife, a close friend, what's wrong with you today? I would probably be on the defensive, right? Because I, I probably think there's nothing wrong with me. I'm perfectly fine. On the other hand, I was trying to think if, if like last night we were at the booth at the community days and I was, you know, passing out things for VBS and, and about our church. And if one of those people said to me, what's wrong with you today? I would be completely caught off guard. Like, no, really, I don't know that there's anything that I possibly could have said, inviting you to church, inviting you to VBS, you know, trying to engage uh, your kids and whatnot. Um, but when someone who knows you pretty well questions you, there very well may be something there that you can't overlook. And lastly, I was thinking about the um, <clears throat> when you kind of see things go on in society and you see, you know, even someone running a stop sign, cheating, stealing, you you kind of get angry and upset because they're getting away with something. Right. And you kind of want you want the policeman to be around the corner. You want them to be caught right away. You kind of want the judgment that belongs to God to happen to them. 
And I just, one thing I try to remind myself all the time is that I'm thankful that God reserves that judgment and introduces grace. Because if that were me, I would want the grace and I would want the judgment to be delayed. But yet our expectations for other people is, is instant judgment. And sometimes that makes you angry. Thanks, Nick. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right. Well, let's close in prayer and ask the Lord to help us in this matter. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your patience, grace, mercy, forgiveness. Uh, Lord, we're more like Ahab than we'd like to admit. It's easy to criticize and condemn him for his covetousness, selfishness, pride, anger, um, all these, these different things that we see in the passage. But Lord, we all have our moments. We all have our moods. Uh, Lord, we, we wrestle with the same things. And Lord, we have an influence, whether we have a family or not, we have a, a sphere of influence. And Lord, uh, just like fire spreads, anger, bitterness, wrath, they spread. And Lord, may, may we never be that person to start the fire. Um, Lord, I, I pray that we would uh, be putting fires out, extinguishing them, and Lord, may you help us by the Spirit of God. Sometimes it's it's um, being okay with no, being okay with uh, things not going as planned, or as long as they go according to your plan, that's all that matters. May we submit our plans to you. If, if the vineyard is, is meant to be, great. If, if not, Lord, may we be willing to let that go and, and move forward, realizing it's just a vineyard. It really doesn't matter. It's amazing the, the small things that will set us off. We ask, Lord, that um, we would be like Elijah. We need to be spirit-filled. We could not have done without spirit-filling and, um, and guidance, divine guidance. And Lord, help us. Sometimes it, it's tough to, to be Elijah. And Lord, help us to be as Ahab, who received the message. Um, certainly had done wrong, but he received it and he repented. And Lord, when, when others in the spirit of Christ confront us about a mood or a decision or pride or selfishness that's impacting others. Lord, may we have the humility to admit our wrongdoing and to go softly. And there's a great word there in scripture. Lord, we pray that um, we would be better men as a result of this study. Uh, Lord, give us wisdom and discernment. Lord, Lord, when to open up to others and, and when to just open up to you and cast our care upon you. Thank you, Lord, that you help us. And, uh, we're grateful again for this study. Thank you that we have the word of God, not just our opinions that we've shared, but we've shared scripture. We've learned from these characters. And Lord, may we be better Christians as a result. Bless the remainder of our day. Help us to go home, not heavy and displeased, but uh, light and joyful and, and just filled with faith. Help us to be a blessing to everyone we meet today. Help us to radiate the joy of Christ in Jesus' name. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Be strong today. Have a good day. You too, Nick. I took a spot today.